Welcome to Grid Connections. I'm your host, Chase Drum. On this podcast, we'll be exploring how our electrical grid is becoming the intersection between the next generation of electric transportation, new digital technologies, and grid infrastructure. Join me in exploring these topics with experts and leaders across the grid. In this episode, we speak with Erica Myers, the principal of transportation electrification at the Smart Electric Power Alliance, also better known by its acronym colloquially as SEPA. Erica's team works on research focused primarily on utility-run managed charging program designs, distribution planning for electric vehicles, utility rates, tariffs, incentives, and EV customer education. She works with everyone from utilities to nonprofits to auto OEMs and even regulators to build awareness around how all of these technologies function along with what they can unlock when used together. In today's episode, we discuss the impact of COVID on electric vehicles, the current state of EV fast charging, the large opportunity that vehicle to grid technology holds and how electric vehicle makers can better engage female car buyers. So SEPA has been around for about a quarter of a century. We uh, focus on clean energy integration with electric utilities and the grid more broadly. So we've been working on a lot of different clean energy integration challenges. And we have four major focus areas, including transportation electrification, grid integration, utility business models, and regulatory innovation. And what's interesting is like you said, the organization has been around for 25 years. What, how has that evolved? And you mentioned four different kind of uh, areas that you guys focus on. And I think that's really interesting because that's a big part, coincidentally, of this podcast, uh, podcast in general, is how there are more and more different kind of industries that are really leading this? Can you kind of highlight how SEPA has evolved and why the group has decided to focus on those four areas? So we have evolved from a solar focused organization. Most of our life was focused on solar energy integration. And about six years ago, the board decided that we can't talk about solar in a silo any longer. We need to talk about all these other distributed energy resources and grid modernization and things like that that are going to enhance the ability for us to integrate more clean energy. And so we expanded the scope of mission. That's actually when I joined SEPA was about five years ago to help uh, expand the research focus areas. And it's been great. We've had a really good experience of expanding that scope and we've been finding what is it that SEPA can do to contribute to the broader goal of clean energy integration and SEPA's vision uh, is probably one of the, the biggest uh, changes. We have a vision of a carbon-free energy future by 2050. So we have 30 years to figure out how to do that. And so SEPA wants to be at the forefront, helping our utility members and the broader industry figure out the steps to get there. And with that kind of broadening of scope and kind of that longer term vision, how does the original interest of solar kind of expand into other energy uh, generating sources to really help accomplish that? Well, we really need a bigger portfolio of options, right? If everything is on the table at this point. And I think that with the expansion of our scope emission, it gives us the ability to evaluate everything kind of on the same ground. Uh, and we are not, you know, as a nonprofit organization uh, based in DC, a lot of folks probably think of us as their typical trade association, but we're very different. We actually focus on opportunities to facilitate and bring together different members of the community so we can find some common ground, we can find some uh, low hanging fruit that we couldn't have otherwise. And we don't advocate for particular policies or regulations we see ourselves really as a convening force. And so we like to think of ourselves as, um, you know, anybody can participate. We don't restrict our membership to any one category of, of uh, industry. Everybody is welcome to be part of our community. I think what's also uh, really powerful about that is not just the focus of SEPA, but what you're doing as an organization to really make your goal super impactful around the actual information, the data, the research. 
uh, specifically, I think it was in June, the recent uh, electric vehicle kind of guideline that you had designed essentially for utilities. Can you share a little bit more information about some of the uh, interesting things that came out of that and the, the point of that um, program? Yeah, absolutely. So we have, uh, like I mentioned before, the communities of SEPA, we have very robust electric vehicle working groups and other working groups covering a different uh, set of topics. Uh, we have a total of 11 working groups at SEPA and our electric vehicle working group has been around for three years. This was research that was developed largely by volunteers who participate in these working groups. And they saw a need to tackle the issue of how other utilities have been deploying EV charging infrastructure, what lessons they learned, what, uh, what best practices that they wanted to share with other utilities around the country. And so they took the initiative to develop this piece and it took a long time to gather all of that intel. It's not just like you can do a literature search and find all this information. They had to really dig in and, and work with a lot of people in the community to gather these insights. And so there's a total of uh, almost 70 different recommendations for utility-led charging infrastructure programs and third-party interconnection best practices as well. So I encourage anybody to take a look at that. It's called the uh, Utility Best Practices for electric vehicle charging infrastructure deployment. What makes this such an interesting, uh, it's not just the normal research that you might find done by some of the, uh, a group and that kind of highlights some of the data points. There's definitely that in there. I think what I really appreciate about it was how it's kind of broken down. There is essentially, if this is all new to you and you, have, you can barely spell electric vehicle or even know what EV is, Here's what you can do as a utility. Or if you're a more uh, kind of forward thinking or been playing around with the technology and in the space for a while, uh, he, here are the steps to really push it further or some of the successes we've seen from others. So I, I think that's what's really cool about it too is it has a clear mission. It has also mm -hmm. kind of really strong data, but then instead of being like your typical really dry research paper maybe, it also just makes it super approachable from a kind of a different breadth of experience and really provides value across the board. Well, I really appreciate that assessment, <laughs> that glowing review for this piece. I like to think that our research is definitely not dry. I like to write the research so it's interesting, that it has a storyline and a narrative and lots of great examples and case studies. That particular one has six case studies. That's the most I've ever done in one report. So I'm really proud of that. And I think that people like to read, you know, and they, but because of how the, the reports are structured, you can find the things that you need to find really quickly. You don't have to read the whole thing. If you just want to learn about EV strategic planning, there's a section for you. If you want to figure out how to develop a transportation electrification team, there's a section for you. If you just want to get into the nitty gritty on how do I make my EV charging infrastructure process more streamlined and more transparent for my customers, there's a section. So we, that's how we really tackle all of the research that we do at SEPA. And that's why I think, you know, I'm not biased, of course, but that's why I think our research is, is really good for our members. Well, and I, I, I do want to make it clear, I'm not being paid or anything by this. I just found it super, I, I realize I, I, am, I probably am way more excited about research papers than probably most people are. Uh, and I, I guess I don't even call it a research paper. That almost does make it sound um, more, more dry than it really is. It is, it is a really cool document. Um, obviously, it's more focused at people in the uh, utility space and that kind of industry. But I think there's definitely great examples that you can kind of just take out of that and share for people who might just even have a passing interest. Um, with that, obviously, there's a lot of work, great work that you and your team have already done. But what are, what are some of the things that your group is working on right now and kind of in the short term that really excites you the most at SEPA? I think everything is exciting. And so it's hard for me to answer that question well because uh, to narrow it down, it's, it's difficult. I'd say the things that I am working towards for this year and next year are of course really exciting for me. Um, we are just about to release another report next week on communications protocols for vehicle grid integration. It's super technical, very wonky, 
Uh, that report may not appeal as much for everybody, but it is so essential. Like I can't stress enough how uh, important it is that the infrastructure we're deploying today is going to be able to communicate with a third party aggregator in the future. A lot of our research is focused on vehicle grid integration. And when I say that word, I mean managed charging and vehicle to grid or vehicle to building. All these functionalities that we talk about at the very, the kind of the, the very core of being able to do these things is to be able to communicate seamlessly to the hardware. And so you have to have the right software embedded in these devices in order to be able to do this. And they have to be networked. They have to communicate with something in order to be able to receive and then send signals. And so uh, communications protocols, it's very hard, is going to enable this future that we keep talking about. And so this guidance document is the first of its kind. It's helping utilities figure out what kind of protocol which one, there's so many to choose from, which one should they go for? And this will allow us to be able to eventually scale the amount of chargers that could be aggregated for these kinds of events uh, through things like signal, demand response signals and so forth. And um, so I'm excited about that piece and I, I hope it's gonna be helpful for utilities if they're starting down this path. Uh, Another report that I'm going to be working on later this year is written for regulators. It's going to be really helping to build a case for why they should care about vehicle grid integration. And at, again, it, it comes down to if we want electric vehicles and the abundance that we hope we'll see in the future, uh, we cannot allow these vehicles to all be charging during peak hours uh, because that's going to exacerbate the peak on our system. It's going to be very expensive to build out the distribution and transmission and then additional generation in order to be able to supply power for a whole new fleet of vehicles. And so getting people to charge off peak is really, really critical. And the time to do it now is now, right? When they're just starting to buy the vehicles, not after they've gotten used to charging whenever they want to, but how do we get the buyers of these cars to first of all, want the cars, but also be more flexible in terms of how they go about charging them. And so um, to, to the regulators we're addressing this content to, it's basically saying, you know, we know that a lot of these programs you're probably reviewing right now are not gonna have a very strong return on investment but that is that investment you're making today is going to yield dividends for our systems in the future. Well, and I, I think there's two really interesting things that you kind of hit on with both of those pieces. First is the vehicle to grid component. And, or I, I guess really that's the main part of it. But then the second part of it is actually taking the idea and making it real because that starts, there's a lot of hurdles, but there, there's a clear path to success for it. And I, I think it's funny because with the idea, when you start talking to people about it, they're a little leery at first or they're kind of confused, but I, I think it's one of those things where you kind of have to work with people in steps. It's, it's no different than mm -hmm. like people who thought, okay, the idea of renting my car on an app where I drive around and then give people rides like 20 years ago, that's how you get murdered. That wasn't yeah. like an app. That is how, <laughs> that's like how serial killers work. And then it evolved and that became Uber and that turned out to be a thing, yeah. uh, let alone its own industry. And I think that's kind of like, at first people are really a little leery of it or it just seems, it yeah. seems odd. But once you start working through the actual ideas of it, there's a lot of great potential. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what's funny is exactly what we were just discussing before we started recording was you're dealing with the storms right now that you're worried that the power might go down. And I was having a conversation the other day with a guy who has a diesel pickup. And he's like, you know, I have a diesel pickup. I use it for my construction business. And why can't I use that like I could a diesel generator to back it up during a storm? I was like, well, there's a few issues, but theoretically they're actually working on that for electric cars. And the instant I started kind of pitching that idea and that mindset to it, he's like, yeah, that makes way more sense. You don't have the pollution. You don't have to worry about burning up the gas. And especially if you live in a house, the last thing you want uh, 
depending where you can or can't park it is parking a car in a garage running all the time. There's health issues with that as well. Yeah. And you start evolving that with the electric car thing where it becomes, you can at least start using it as a way to test the ability to use it as a backup source, but then start evolving that more to exactly what you're talking about. That is an issue already is time of use and start mm-hmm. kind of changing the mindset of how for the average consumer, not only is it they're saving money, but immediately it could also become a really convenient way to be a backup source in an emergency, like the, uh, whether that be a natural disaster, or just a uh, telephone pole, someone crashes in a telephone pole. That happened to me about a month ago and 10,000 people were out of power in my area. Mm-hmm. No, issue or no like it was just one of those things you don't plan for perfectly sunny day it wasn't too many people were on the system it was just freak uh, accident and then once you kind of get over that hurdle and the the idea of people actually thinking of the greater v to g kind of example of where it's actually going into the grid as a renewable source gets really powerful and i i think that is also interesting where i'd kind of like you to discuss Mm how it augments what we talked about before around renewable energy, how it's not just about time of use and that um, trying to help kind of those peaks, but there's actually ways you can maximize it for renewables. Can you uh, share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that there are intermittency challenges with renewable energy. And so a lot of these studies that have come out have said that you need a lot of stationary storage in order to be able to help smooth out some of those intermittency challenges. And, but, you know, we look around and we say, well, we're gonna be doing all these electric vehicles and they have somewhere between 60 and upwards of 90 kW on board. And if somebody's not using that entire capacity on their daily commute, which most people don't, most people drive less than 40 miles, they don't need 300 miles range. What could we do to tap into that battery during these times when somebody has some flexibility and say, we'll pay you this amount to be able to access your battery during these critical peak times. It's gonna save us millions and millions of dollars on new, um, maybe new uh, natural gas peaker plants, or maybe it'll uh, reduce the amount of, of money that we have to spend on a wholesale power market uh, cost um, at these critical peak times. And and on top of it, we don't have to own and maintain uh, these large stationary storage units, which we may not fully leverage over the course of the year. So how could we tap into our customers' batteries and uh, be able to save everybody a lot of money? And that's the, for residential or fleet vehicle to grid, this is really the holy grail. It's all of the benefits of stationary storage minus all of the potential negatives. However, <laughs> this is a really hot topic because I have posted a few things on LinkedIn and I would say that probably my vehicle to grid posts have the most comments, the most pro camp people and negative camp people and they're both like vociferously debating through this LinkedIn platform. And it's just been, I just kind of stand back and watch the comments roll in. So um, I've been working on uh, an article, something along, is there hope or hype for residential vehicle to grid? I, and uh, I'm hoping to tease out some of these different arguments as part of that. Well, that, that is kind of interesting to hear between your now amateur LinkedIn moderator status <laughs> and what you're, what you're doing in the more professional side, working with regulators and also uh, OEMs and just general uh, groups. What are some of the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're kind of seeing everything, you're seeing both the logical and kind of the emotional concerns around this. What are some of the kind of recurring, uh, I guess, ideas that are kind of misperceptions, whether it be around EVs or even V to G that you don't think are really true anymore, like around the safety or challenges around range and battery degradation. Are there any you can share with us? Well, the one that I hear a lot of times is related to what happens to the batteries after the car is no longer needing them or, or the battery pack becomes too degraded to use for a car. 
um, people are like, oh, well, we'll just have a whole bunch of batteries going into the landfill. And I can point to a lot of examples of how that's probably not going to happen. There are lots of companies sprouting up on figuring out how to aggregate these batteries post vehicle use for stationary storage purposes. So there will be a market around that. Um, there's already a robust lithium ion recycling market um, as well, though I don't notice that that's the most optimal uh, destination for some of these start these batteries, which will still have a lot of capacity left in them after they're finished in the car. Um, you can look at the lead acid battery market. We have 98% roughly of recycling of lead acid batteries in this, largely because there is a very mature market for that now. There's a supply chain that's matured and, and it's very efficient and very cost effective to do that. And so I anticipate the same thing will happen for these car batteries. Um, so that's, that's just one example. Yeah, that, that's actually, I think, still a common one, but also one of those issues where it's imagining a problem that doesn't really exist for a solution or where it's assuming that there's so many electric vehicles that these batteries from all these millions of electric vehicles on the roads are just piling up in landfills. We can't develop the land because there's just batteries everywhere. Kids are tripping over them. It's really, could it become a, a problem? Yes, but it, it's, if you look at exactly what you said with lead acid, that is already have it, that already has its own um, essentially industry and infrastructure to take them apart. China mm -hmm. is already doing it for lithium ion purely because there is actually a larger scale of EVs already on the road and they are essentially figuring this out. Yeah. Autoline had a great uh, interview with Bob Gallion, who used to be the CTO of uh, CATL. And he was saying, yeah, this already exists in China. It's not a problem. But I, I think what's even more fascinating to me is what you look at. You're, you're seeing this in Europe. I'm, I'm sure it's in China as well. But here in the US, the other thing you start seeing is you just do a quick Google search and use Tesla, i3, any of these EV batteries have their own secondary market before the car, the car might be scrapped, but people are going to junkyards, ripping yeah. the batteries out and using them from everything from their own homemade grid storage <laughs> uh, batteries, which I'm not sure where that's I don't that know falls. how safe that sounds. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, they're, they are also repurposing them to make right. their own EV conversions and that's yeah. perfectly safe and uh, yeah. doable. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that is kind of always the fascinating misperception. I mean, and on top of it, gas, oil have worked for a long time, but once you use it, you use it. You can't really just take an old, you can take a gas tank because it's made out of the metal. Mm -hmm. You can't get the gas back and recycle it and then put it in a new battery or mm -hmm. into new gas. Mm -hmm. um, or unless you get down the whole weird of CO2 sequestration, but that's a, that's a whole nother fun podcast, I guess. Yeah. I don't uh, know very much about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's questionable. It's more theoretical. So it's questionable. Who knows how much of it anyway? Uh, some, some places are finally doing it, but it, it doesn't seem as, it seems like a bigger challenge by far than the actual issue we're talking about where it comes to not even the recycling, but clearly there's already a market for secondhand batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of going off that, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing as far in the, in the more grounded side of stuff, as far as where renewables are going and where electric vehicles might be going? Is it going to be uh, renewables? At, I mean, solar's become so cheap and so that's mm -hmm. scaling. And then the EVs now or whatever battery form, is that really what it needs to just keep this momentum? Or what, what is it mm -hmm. that you're seeing at SEPA? Yeah, so actually it's interesting just how much overlap there is between the consumers of electric vehicles and the consumers of solar energy. Uh, and we've seen these industries kind of pop up around this phenomenon of a solar canopy with an EV charger next to it. Um, we see a lot of the solar websites starting to introduce EV content on their website and how to install a charger and even better, how to power your car with solar. Uh, and uh, so we're starting to see a whole new crop of inverters popping up. So these are DC AC inverters that have a charger um, 
connected to the inverter. So you immediately get the solar power and you know, it immediately feeds your car um, without having to go through any other part of your house. Um, and that is really an interesting trend and one that I see picking up a lot of steam. And I think actually on-site solar and maybe with storage um, can be a really good reliability and resilience opportunity as well for fleets. So these are places where, you know, if a distribution warehouse, for example, wanted to incorporate more EV charging part of their fleet makeup, um, they could add solar and storage to um, increase the reliability of these vehicles in the event that there's a power outage or they have a weather event or something like that um, that knocks out the power to, to fuel these vehicles. And so we see some, again, uh, possibly dual purpose um, where this, uh, these entities have the sustainability target for renewable energy generation, as well as reducing emissions in their vehicles. And so this is kind of another opportunity to, to mix the two together. And so we actually this year at our North America Smart Energy Week, which is co-hosted between SEPA and the Solar Energy Industries Association have launched a brand new uh, part of that show called Electric Vehicle International. And that is really largely dedicated to identifying the synergies between these two fields. Well, I, I think it's obviously that's become a big part of like Tesla's whole business model is really trying to bring all these things down to mm -hmm. the in consumer, which traditionally yeah. had kind of been either a DIY thing or just really you'd have to kind of go to all these different, um, I mean, it's not that difficult, but you'd have to go to a solar provider, then you'd have to get the charger and then you'd have to get the electric car. And maybe there's overlap in two of those three. I think that that's an area where I think uh, what you're talking about is perfect because it seems like there's such a clear opportunity, uh, especially also looking at fleets, but for partnerships between whether that's Ford, BMW, or whichever OEM, and then name mm -hmm. XYZ solar uh, manufacturer to really kind of unlock some pretty clear business uh, between the two without having to really invest beyond their strengths. That's a really good idea. I hadn't really thought about a strategic partnership quite like that, but that would be interesting. Well, <laughs> well there, there's a freebie for you. <laughs> this podcast just paid, made, it made sense for you to join it today. How about that? <laughs> um, obviously, once again, we're glad you're on it. But I, I think going back to fleets, is that where you see a lot of this kind of experimentation and probably the first real kind of steps in validating uh, vehicle to grid to a lot of maybe not, not just people in general, but regulators and OEMs that there's clearly a way to kind of get this and get that uh, interest and buy-in to really scale it further. Yeah, I think solar is one of those uh, opportunities to talk about how you could do renewable energy integration more efficiently. They call it um, basically preventing curtailment, right? Is is if you can find a way to um, use those electrons through flexible loads, then you can avoid having to curtail a solar or wind farm um, for a period of time when there's low demand. Usually that happens like in the springtime when, when people aren't really using their heating or air conditioning. Uh, and, um, and so this would be a way that you, you've got, let's say, for example, a workplace charging program. And that workplace charging program gets a special incentive or they got rebates for chargers or things like that. Um, they can delay the charge uh, for their employees until that solar window starts to open up. So instead of charging right at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, it could be delayed until closer to 11 when you start to see more solar hitting the system. And so then you've got a couple of hours window roughly um, with a level two charger to refill that car and then have a place to, to funnel a lot of these uh, solar systems. And similarly for wind at night, um, so where a residential system, residential managed charging program comes in place and you could um, delay the timer to start on the, the vehicle until you start to see a wind ramp. Okay, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way between the actual mm -hmm. resource. So mm -hmm. solar kind of benefits the large building or kind of fleet size stuff. And then almost wind is best for night for residential where you're gonna see a higher load anyway. 
Mm-hmm. That is actually really interesting. So with that, I mean, to me, it makes the most sense to start with fleets just because instead of trying to get a hundred homes with 10 or a hundred homes, maybe even let's say even 10 homes with like 10 Nissan Leafs or something, that's a little, that's like 600, roughly 600, 650 kilowatts, uh, kilowatt hours. That's a decent battery. But if you do get uh, like a local bus provider who's got five or six uh, or even a local distribution center that might have full on electric trucks. Then you start talking about kind of the megawatt air, uh, hour level backup along yeah. with actually having a lot of the infrastructure probably in place just because they have maybe they're closer to um, uh, not sub panels, but uh, substations mm-hmm. to really kind of make that bigger dent. Is that yeah. how the conversations have kind of been led so far or is it, is it kind of coming from all sides between the residential and commercial interests around it? Well, so to back up a little bit, I think fleet electrification is still something that a lot of people are exploring. Um, We haven't seen a ton of fleet EVs hit the streets yet. Um, So I think that a lot of this is still (laughs) theoretical. (laughs) But I think that it could be really interesting because fleet managers are incredibly savvy about thinking about trying to shave as, as many pennies off every mile as they can. Um, because it comes down to how can I be more profitable and competitive than my competitors in my space, right? So um, they're thinking very savvy in terms of of shaving off as much of that um, operations cost as possible. And if you're introducing a product to these commercial customers that they could potentially use for energy arbitrage, uh, that could be really interesting from a financial perspective. So you've got to make it interesting for them to first of all even pick up the phone. Um, but then if you have a compelling product and you want to tap into that EV fleet battery um, and you have a way to easily do that and translate that to a manager, I think then there, there could be some more pickup and interest eventually. Um, what we've seen primarily right now with fleets in, for V2G in the near term uh, an easier one would be school bus fleet electrification because that's a, a well-known, most of the buses aren't being used very much during the summer. And so, you know, with, in areas where there's a high summer peak, then being able to leverage those school bus batteries and, you know, which are, of course are very large, um, makes a lot of financial sense and it's logistically much easier. Um, but there's only so many school buses and, Again, you're, you're only kind of hitting a certain period of time. So if you're wanting a more flex- flexible storage solution, um, looking around and seeing what other kinds of fleets might have some flexibility there um, with financial incentives could be interesting. But again, it's, it's gonna be really interesting to see this, this industry evolve. And I, I'm excited to see what happens in the next five years. Well, I think I, and the, the school bus thing, taking into account summer is a really interesting thing. And given the current mm-hmm. state of stuff, I don't know how much those school bus are, are going to be used in certain areas for a while, uh, given, yeah. I believe here in Portland, they've announced through November, it's going to be all virtual. Yeah. Um, so that, that is kind of interesting. You do have these buses lying dormant mm-hmm. and they're interesting, I think, uh, I've thought about when it comes to buses in general is some of the depots might be on the outer, uh, outer kind of the more of the suburbs, but the vast majority, at least from what I've seen in uh, a lot of cities is they're actually pretty central. They have to be pretty well located to get into these routes. So you do have the potential to have a lot of decent uh, battery packs at a fleet size inside the city where it's kind of closest to some of these pretty serious loads where I think it could have a big impact, whereas a lot of the energy generation is not happening inside the city. It's miles away yeah. at either a dam or at best a peaker plant or something still pretty far out. And so it kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier with the things that you can unlock through energy efficiency with solar, where it's the, one of its big values is it's just that immediacy and being at where the energy is needed mm-hmm. and kind of taking out, uh, at least in the residential side of stuff, taking out those line losses and any other kind of lags you'd have there. Uh, One thing that you kind of mentioned that I think if you work with utilities and the space is a term a lot of people might be familiar with, but if you're not, is the term and concept of arbitrage. Can you kind of explain that 
a little bit and how that plays into a lot of the topics you have to work with? Oh, well, there are people who could probably explain arbitrage a lot better than me, but I'll do my best. So basically, it is where you can sell power at a higher price than you buy power. So in, uh, for, for example, wholesale power markets that have a day ahead um, hour or hourly rate, um, or even less than hourly, um, if you're looking at the nodes, um, each of them has different prices throughout the day and it's expensive, you know, more or less expensive to service that node. Um, depending on the time of the year, generation mix going on, if there's a power plant that went down that wasn't anticipated, then the prices could go up. And so it's really a matter of tapping in and having real time data and understanding the market to be able to really take advantage of something like that. But like I said before, I feel like the, the fleet managers kind of understand that. It's not that dissimilar from what they do with fuel hedging now for their fuel supply contracts. And some of them are very, very sophisticated. They're, they're looking at the world oil prices and they're able to understand at any point, point in time when to buy, when to sell. And so um, I feel like there's a, an opportunity to tap into this industry and, and translate it as long as we can translate it to them. Um, they, they get it and then they'll, they'll be bought into this idea. Of course, first, they have to make sure the technology works. <laughs> they have to make sure that the EVs work for them and then kind of they'll be more receptive. Okay, this is, this is what our charging in infrastructure needs to be and this is what our experience has been with charging and we feel comfortable because we have a pretty good handle on what the situation is. So then maybe we'll be more likely to explore these sorts of um, revenue generating opportunities. But there, there's a process to get there. <laughs> I, I think you actually explained it quite well. Uh, the, the concept isn't that wild. It's really the variables that you start having to deal with yeah. uh, and what is valued more at certain times of the day and it goes from there. But no, that, I think that's a good explanation of it. Given, uh, given your role at SEPA with electrification and what you're doing with the VDG, I think anytime people talk about EVs, and this is, I think, across the board between people who have a lot of experience with them to people who have misperceptions, the thing comes in with, I'm going to drive 400 miles today. I need some fast charging. I need 12 megawatt 1.81 gigawatt speed sort of thing what where, where do you stand on is it really the necessary is it necessary to always have kind of the fast charging technology or mm. is a lot of this a bigger issue than people perceive it to be yeah so that's you've, you've hit on something that really keeps me up at night which is are we really trying to emulate the gas station model is that really the best solution for transportation electrification? And the gas station model is basically using and relying heavily on DC fast charging infrastructure in order to be able to refuel the cars very quickly. And the, the challenge with this is that when you have these uh, higher and higher level of chargers being deployed and cars that are able to take a higher and higher level of charging speed, um, you're going to get in a situation where if you have a bank of these, let's say 350 kW chargers, now granted, there's not really a car that's able to take 350, but someday there will be. Uh, if you have a bank of these things that could be several megawatts of power demand being pulled from the system in five, 10 minute increments, and that is like a couple Walmarts <laughs> size power, which Walmart, you know, is pretty predictable load. Uh, going from that to something that's just, you know, very spiky, it's going to be more challenging. It's not going to be impossible because the system can handle it and, and we have very smart utility staff that can figure it out, but it's not necessarily going to be optimal. And that's a situation that we need to figure out today is what we know we need fast charging for certain applications. We know people will need access to this. So how can we think ahead uh, knowing that these are going to be problems and find solutions to them today before it becomes a problem. And so we've seen a lot of people um, throwing out the idea of putting on-site storage with the uh, growth of DC fast chargers. And then the, the storage unit can help smooth out some of that spikiness of uh, the charging demand. And also at the same time, maybe save some of those 
uh, charging infrastructure networks some, fun, some money on demand charges. The problem is that um, the storage is not in, it's not free, right? So it's, it's an additional financial cost and not necessarily um, something that's financially prudent at this point for the industry. So uh, what are some win-wins? Where, where could the utility potentially step in with the solution in hand in hand with the charging network infrastructure provider? And together they can find a solution that's cost-effective for everyone. And these are the sorts of things we're trying to suss out right now at SEPA. And it kind of goes to something we talked about previously. Uh, I, I think it was you that said it's really the consumer, and this is kind of getting these misperceptions where they're kind of putting uh, the cart before the horse. Uh, but it, it's really at the end of the day, the consumer doesn't want to think about when they have to charge. They just want it charged. Mm -hmm. And when you start kind of working through who needs to be a part of that, obviously the actual OEM has a part of that. And then the utility is really more and more having influence on how and how that works. But it, it seems like in my experience and what I've heard from others, some of the utilities, they're, they're being a little more um, aggressive about it. But overall, there is still kind of a, uh, a slow move, uh, let's put it that way, in towards that direction. What would you say to someone who might be listening, who is a utility as to like, what is some of the value in really making those investments now or kind of leading in this area? Yeah, I'd say that uh, we're in a really unique time where we're very beginning the ground level of the deployment of this charging infrastructure. And we have a, a window of opportunity to experiment with lots of different technologies. And we need to take advantage of this window before it becomes, you know, uh, best practice or, or everyday occurrence to, to put in these big banks of charging um, there are 350 kW chargers. Let's let's get ahead of it and let's come up with some pilots or some demonstration projects hand in hand with the OEMs and or the, the charging network providers. And uh, let's see if we, we can make something pencil. Uh, and, and I think right now is the time to experiment, uh, not just for this, but for lots of different challenges related to vehicle grid integration. And, and this is where, you know, I think a community like SEPA is so valuable for this community because we have everybody at the table with us. We're we're all working together. We have 600 plus people who are part of our EV working group. And I am of the mindset that no one person has all the answers. It really, we really rely heavily on the best ideas from a large group of people in order to make positive change. And so uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think that it's something we don't talk enough about because I feel like people in our industry feel that if they don't come out with the solution that people uh, assume that they're not smart or they don't have all the answers and so therefore they're not a, a good resource. And I think for me, the experience has been saying to the community, here's the problem. What are your best ideas and how do you think you can solve them? And that's really what I'm hoping with this conversation with you today, Jace, is that people who listen to this will say, I have a, I have a solution for that. It's not necessarily something I've ever seen used for EV charging, but I think it'll work for you guys. And it works in this industry, it'll work for you guys. These are the kinds of ideas that I'm craving. I'm looking for these things. I, I think, you know, we don't have the solutions for everything yet. And, um, and so we're open. Going, going off of that, if someone <laughs> is listening, uh, can you share a few examples of what some of those challenges might be? Yeah, so I think for uh, vehicle grid integration, there's a whole set of challenges. Uh, we have issues with network connectivity, uh, with the Wi-Fi to the chargers themselves, losing that connection because usually these chargers are located outside or in a garage where there's a thick wall between the, the Wi-Fi router and the, and the charging unit itself. And so we have a huge uh, disconnect uh, issue with residential managed charging programs. And unfortunately, uh, you know, there are other solutions are, that are out there really expensive. For example, if you're using um, cellular, that's, that's a very expensive um, fee for a residential system. 
And so network connectivity, pretty basic. We don't have a really good solution for it yet. Um, another one is just the cost of installing. It's, it's, it's expensive to install these chargers. Um, this is a cost for consumers. How do we get more of these uh, networked and smart charging infrastructure uh, devices into the field with such a high expense to install them? Is there something that people have thought of that we could do this in a, in a cheaper way, uh, a more efficient way? Um, let's see, there's others. <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, in general, when we think about how we could go about aggregating all these things, um, Maybe, the, maybe it doesn't make sense to have lots and lots of different charging platforms. Maybe it makes sense to have one central platform that lots and lots of different vendors can use. And then we're able to scale more cost effectively. We have additional cybersecurity benefits associated with that. It's easier for utilities to tap into it because it's one integration versus multiple integrations. Um, is there another industry that has come up with a solution for this already that we could look to as an example. Um, there, and it's, you know, a lot of these issues are not just for EV charging, you know, this is an issue related to distributed energy resources and frankly, new industries more broadly. It's, you know, we're in a lot of startup mode, um, you know, we kind of, we kind of do with what we've got, but I think that with charging, we have to get really sophisticated really quickly if we're going to get ahead of this. Gotcha. With um, kind of being at the intersection of quite a few different, uh, like I said, regulators, uh, groups, OEMs, what are some of the, I guess, challenges that you're dealing with that you, you mentioned technology and in certain, uh, like Europe, I believe they've gone pretty much like a CSS uh, is their kind of default. And then uh, I think Japan is kind of the only one that does Chatamo extensively, but because of, as far as I know, CCS isn't the, or CSS isn't, is it capable of doing the fast? Because I think that's the only one, or Chatamo is the only one that's capable of doing V2G. Is that right. correct? That's correct. Yeah. So the CCS is not going to be V2G capable from what I understand until 2025. So I guess with, with that challenge, where, where do you see like the, the hindrance in them wanting to push that out so far, or is it just trying to even establish uh, CCS as being that standard? Well, CCS, uh, you know, again, kind of going back to this whole point around open standards and interoperability that our research touches on all the time. Um, you know, we're in a situation where there were two major connectors. And so all the charging hardware in the country, basically for DC fast charging has two connectors, except for Tesla, of course, because they have their own proprietary connector. Um, and so you go, we pull up to a bank of char chargers and you, you know, I have a Nissan Leaf, so I'm looking for the Chadmo. And usually, you know, there's a Chadmo off to the side somewhere. <laughs> I go, go charge there. Um, but you know that's an extra expense that um, you know you may or may not always have to have, um, and so I think that it's a positive that the industry is moving towards alignment around a single charging standard. Um, so that's that's a positive thing. But I I can't really comment on the timeline for the CCS V2G functionality because um, I haven't been as immersed in that as as some of my peers. Gotcha. Um, well, I guess to segue a little bit with SEPA, um, what are you seeing? Of course, uh, some parts of the country are getting better. Some parts are getting worse with COVID. Are the, wh what are some of the trends or impacts that you're seeing with this too, um, whether that be energy usage or electric vehicle adoption? Mm -hmm. I've been watching that closely and it's still a little unclear what the EV sales impact has been. Um, we've seen reports coming out from Tesla that say that they have actually had really good sales since COVID, um, since quarantine. And so, you know, I think one of the benefits from Tesla is 
model is that most of their vehicles are purchased online. And so people don't actually have to go to a showroom or go to a dealer and risk exposing themselves. Um, they can just do it from the comfort of their home. And maybe now that people have a little bit of extra time to think about their vehicle purchase and looking around at the landscape, then they, they can find the Tesla and, and make that decision. But I don't know how that's impacted um, the rest of the EV charging or the EV um, light duty vehicle purchases at this point. And we're waiting to see the results of that. Do you think it's still a little, I mean, I, I know, I believe that was the second quarter, pretty much outside of Tesla, all vehicles were down yeah. pretty much globally, but yeah. EVs were kind of showing that they weren't nearly as like, their impact was more minimal comparative to mm -hmm. just traditional combustion engines. Do you, do you think it's definitely still too soon to really tell what will be coming out of this as far as a larger impact to EVs? It's a little bit soon, and there's a couple of other trends that are related to this is, are people going to be moving away from transit um, because of COVID concerns, and are they going to be buying cars that you know, previously they didn't own a car before? And are those individuals who are now buying cars going to buy electric cars? These are a whole new segment of potential consumers that they hadn't previously owned. So, well, I mean, obviously we don't want necessarily a whole bunch of new cars in the road. Um, so I hope people aren't defecting from public transit. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I am interested to see what these you know, consumer decisions look like. And another thing I've been looking at is, is how electric vehicles resonate with all consumers uh, and particularly with women. So unfortunately not necessarily seen as strong interest among women for electric vehicle purchases as we have with men. And so I'm kind of trying to figure out why that is and what is it about EVs that um, is not necessarily as appealing at this point. Any ideas why that might be as far as just general advertising or where that message is getting in front of women and just not resonating or any ideas why that might be? Yeah, there was a, a really interesting maker article that was a marker article that was published uh, earlier this year in January that basically said EVs have a gender or a women problem was the title of it. Was, EVs have a women problem. And their conclusion was that uh, the advertisements are geared heavily towards men and that the style of the vehicle and the functionality of the vehicle and how the vehicle is being described, for example, the torque and the power and the steering capability and all these things, the, you know, kind of like the, yeah, like this car is going to take over like everybody on the road. That doesn't necessarily appeal as much to women. Women are making these purchasing decisions usually for other people, including their family members. Um, in addition to themselves. And so they're looking for things like, can I fit all my kids stuff in the back of the, the car? Can I fit three car seats next to each other in this car? Am I gonna be able to uh, beat all the needs that I'm looking for in all these different particular um, scenarios that my family has? And so I think, you know, when we think about how we're, we're talking about EVs, that it's really important to consider how we're talking about them for everybody. That's, a, that's actually a great point because I, I completely agree with that. Usually a big part of it is the handling, the performance. Some people say pro con because the thing you notice immediately when you drive one is how quiet it is. Some people like that, some people don't. I personally kind of like it. Yeah. Um, however, yeah, you start getting to things probably that resonate more with not, not even women, but maybe just average, once again, EV purchasing is such mm -hmm. a small sliver of automotive mm -hmm. that I, I think a lot of that messaging doesn't resonate with the two big things when that's kind of what you mentioned is daily usability yeah. and also safety are usually yeah. the two big buying points. Yeah. Even when you start going up market um, like to Mercedes and others, like a big thing, like performance is great, but at the end of the day uh, it's much more likely what's going to get tested is not how fast it is off the light. It's if you get T-boned or something, or mm -hmm. you're making a merge into something, you have that blind spot detection. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So I, I think that that is something that a lot of EV owners realize, especially with the fact that you usually have larger crumple zones mm-hmm. and stuff like that, but it's not really taken for granted or put in the forefront in that advertising. Mm-hmm. At SEPA, is that something that ever kind of comes up in conversations with OEMs when, you, uh, when you're talking with them? Not so much, no. Um, most of the conversations I've had with OEMs are really largely around vehicle grid integration. So they're looking for utilities to work with on testing out their vehicle telematics, for example, with the managed charging program. Um, The the research that I'm doing for the women in EVs actually is an independent project. And I consider it more like a passion project that I've been working on. (laughs) I'd love to hear what the results from that, because what is interesting to me is totally true with Tesla, totally true with like the new uh, Tesla, Rivian, kind of the ones that are new and starting it. Rivian, their twist is instead of how fast it is, it's how well it climbs up rocks. Once again, cool, but not probably very practical or usable. However, you start looking at the traditional OEMs and you've got uh, Volvos coming out with their essentially the Polestar, which is once again, a performance sedan, not, I mean, sedans in general are kind of a dying market versus the SUVs and then You've got Ford who's coming to the market with the Ford Mustang, even though it's a crossover. And once again, that message, when someone probably hears an electric Mustang, they kind of probably are turned off before they even see it because they think it's a performance car instead of closer to like a Ford Explorer or something that might be more practical day to day. Yeah, I saw that article um, that was just published recently about how the Ford Performance Group had upgraded the Mach-E uh, to have 1,400 horsepower. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> who needs 1,400 horsepower? <laughs> Maybe it's the, the my inner American. I'm like, I'll take it. Sure, why not? But <laughs> once again, yeah, I better have a big crumple zone because I know I'm not gonna, it's not going to last more than a week. <laughs> you, you would not actually be able to use that car as it's intended. On the street, oh, no, right? no, like, no, not at that all. That is a car you'd put on the racetrack. Um, but yeah. because... Because of motors, you know, they have, I think they have five motors on this thing, electric motors. And so um, it it just can go insane, insanely fast, insanely quickly. Um, But again, that's again, how the automakers are talking about these cars. Um, And as, you know, a mom myself and thinking about someday my daughter will be a teenager who wants to drive a car. Heck no, she's not getting one of those cars. She's not getting a 1,400 horsepower She's not Mustang. getting a 1,400 yeah. horsepower I don't. Body. I think I'm too young for a 1,400 <laughs> power Mustang. Well, I, I think that's, I, I, that, that'll be super fascinating to see that come out because I, I think you're, you're totally right. It's even to take away how it's positioned to average people or even women in particular, there is, I think the automotive space has always kind of yearn to go back to this kind of muscle car performance thing. And so that's where they kind of default to from a marketing standpoint. Cause I think right now you're even to take it out of the automotive sector, you're seeing a lot of like the traditional business, you have a disruptor and now everyone's trying to be the second mover market leader. And all it is usually is just kind of copying like, okay, people buy these performance Teslas, then let's just make a performance electric car and we'll sell that and we'll hit our quota versus and obviously Tesla kind of had to do that just to get known. But I mean, at the end of the day, like I've been fortunate to drive quite a few different Teslas and the thing, the speed is great, mm-hmm. but most of the time what I've noticed and what I think most be- resonates with most people is just the usability of the car. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I was always impressed with like the Model S it's a sedan, but it's storage capabilities cause it doesn't have all of the traditional uh, combustion engine things. You can get like a full door. You can go to Home Depot and load those things up. And once again, that's an added benefit. It's not a cost-effective car for a lot of people, but it's really just taking that kind of clean sheet approach and just making something usable. So I I would be really interested to hear what comes out of this and uh, would love to talk with you more uh, after you've done that to kind of hear about some of these uh, things that you've taken away from it. Sure, I'm happy to continue the conversation. (laughs) <laughs> Great. I, I realize we're coming up to the hour, kind of the hour mark. So I would love to just um, give you the opportunity to just kind of share if 
someone is interested in learning more about SEPA, whether they're uh, a utility or they just want to learn more like on a webinar, what, what are some of the things that SEPA is doing right now to share their knowledge and kind of get awareness about, their, uh, about the organization? Yeah, so a great first place to go for more information about our electric vehicle research is our website at sepapower.org. And we have everything available there. If you want to take a look at our research, including our reports, we have on-demand webinars. Uh, we have links to uh, articles and blogs uh, that we've published over the years. And it's a really great way to get introduced to everything that we've been working on. A lot of our uh, research, like you mentioned before, is really geared towards the utility audience. But I feel like it could be really helpful for a lot of non-utility industry members who want to understand what the utilities are thinking about when it comes to electric vehicle integration. If they want to get kind of like underneath the covers, what are the top of mind issues for them? Where are the problems? Where are the challenges? Uh, where are the opportunities? Um, we have one report on managed charging that we published last year that's really more of a market report. It's got a really good overview of the landscape of the managed charging industry and all the different ways you can go about aggregating this load for demand response purposes. Um, we have another report on residential EV rates that I was really proud to publish last November with our partners E for the Future and NLX and the Brattle Group, which really did some uh, really good initial research on how EV specific rates have done so far. Like, you know, where where uh, are the best utilities in terms of the uptake of EV, and, or I should say enrollment of EV rates and, and what, um, what examples haven't been as successful. So we really wanna figure out what is it about this process that deters people or attracts people. And so we've had a whole section talking about metering you know, that's another area where, you know, kind of my initial call to everybody, if you have a solution that doesn't involve a sub meter or second meter, and then it's really inexpensive, that might be a great opportunity to, to reach out to us and let us know if you have a good solution for that. Um, there's, uh, you know, all these reports have a lot of those kinds of ideas in there. And so I'd encourage people to check them out. Um, if you become a member, then you have more access to the community that I mentioned before. Um, including our EV working group, and we have subcommittees on everything from utility rates and tariffs to managed charging and vehicle to grid. We have one focused on distribution planning, and we have another one focused on fleet electrification. So these are some of the major topics we're working on for this year, but that, of course, evolves every single year. I, I think what you just said, especially with utilities, is super powerful that I think the OEM automotive, going back to like the idea of strategic partnerships, that is one that I think is desperately needed. You're starting to see some of that around maybe home and charging infrastructure, but as this really scales, I, I think that is also an area where the two really need to start figuring out how they're going to work together if a Absolutely. lot of them, and valid why they don't want to take the full on Tesla approach and do all, a lot of this themselves. I, I think that utilities and automakers have a lot in common more than they think in terms of working together and collaboratively. And one of the blogs we posted recently is that uh, automakers and utilities, the romance that's meant to be, and I don't come up with these titles, by the way. <laughs> we have a really smart marketing team that has way more, more creative ideas on titles than I do, but it's true. I do think that there is something there that uh, these two industries could really be strong if they worked more collaboratively together. Re real quickly, could you elaborate on what, what that is or maybe a couple of bullet points of where you think that is? Yeah, so I think it, it comes down to information exchange. That's probably the biggest one. I know for automakers, the idea of working with 3,300 electric utilities across the U.S. seems fairly daunting, and I don't blame them. It is very daunting. It's even daunting for me, and this is my industry that I serve. Um, so I think that uh, just trying to think about it in the context of how do I work with all these utilities with a product that is pretty much the same from state to state, even from country to country. Uh, and so I think that um, information exchange is really critical here. Those information utilities can share with automakers and the automakers can share with utilities, for example, where they sell their cars would really give utilities a lot of insight into where they need to provide grid upgrades. 
if they know that they're selling a lot of these cars into a particular neighborhood, they know that they'll, hey, I'll probably need to replace this transformer before it blows up. You know, I don't want people to be out of power. So let, how can I get ahead of this? Um, and then similarly, I think um, in the vein of, of information exchanges is ideation around how we might be able to leverage the vehicles for vehicle grid integration at some point in the future. Not, not necessarily just vehicle to grid, but managed charging. How can we connect you know, all these vehicles that are moving and mobile and they're all these different places. Um, so they're not gonna be like your traditional DER, right? They're not gonna be something that you know, okay, it's at this address and it operates this way and it's got a lot of predictability. So how can um, the telematics in the car really tell a story to utility on how they may be able to design programs that are far more intelligent and far more consumer friendly than what we have today? Yeah, kind of getting ahead of us, like you said, the Walmart that all of a sudden can just kind of pop up on the energy grid if yeah. a bunch of EVs decide to go on a road trip. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Erica, I, I want to say thank you. I, I think you mentioned the other day that there's an upcoming webinar that SEPA is hosting. Is there information you can share with that for people who are listening? Yeah, so we talked about the report we just released at the beginning of this year, or sorry, uh, end of June, I should say, uh, June 30th, uh, the utility best practices for EV charging infrastructure deployment. We'll be having a webinar about that at the end of August. I encourage you to go to our website at sepapower.org and go to the events tab and you can register there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Erica. We look forward to speaking with you soon. And today, this has just been super great on learning uh, what's going on in the space and what SEPA and your, your team is doing to really make a difference there. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for letting me share this information with you, Chase. Appreciate it. Thank you. My <laughs> pleasure. Talk soon. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening. Be sure to visit our website, connectingthegrid.com. There you can listen to our podcasts, contact us about sponsorship, or even be a guest on Grid Connections. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on your favorite podcast streaming service. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Thanks again, and I look forward to us learning more together soon.